Christmas and glad that you are here this day. Uh, this is one of two Sundays in the year that we can call Low Sunday, the one after Christmas and the one after Easter. And so you are, you are, um, it's great that you are a part of one of those Low Sundays, so glad that you are here with us today. Um, invite everyone who is here today to fill out the welcome sheets at the end of your rows and passes along to your neighbor. Um, and today I don't believe we're going to be having any Sunday school or anything after church, so you can stay for as long as you would like for fellowship, well, or until the trustee kicks you out of the church. So, um, so again, I'm glad that you're here, and thank you to those of you who are moving up. I will now look over to that side. Um, um, as you might be able to hear in my voice, I am sick again. So, um, Lisa, Pastor Elaine, and my wife Sally all had colds, so it was inevitable that I would get one. So I did. So I will be greeting after church, but I will not be shaking your hand. Um, I do not want to pass this along, even though it seems like it's being passed to everyone and anyone. So um, let's all try to practice as good care of each other as we possibly can. Um, now is the time in our service, or now is the time in which we offer our prayer requests, our joys, and our concerns. Um, as I was coming into church uh, this morning, I heard on the news that there was a, another attack of Jewish people on the seventh day of Hanukkah. There were five people who were stabbed at a Hanukkah party, and uh, we have not heard yet of their condition or what might be uh, going on with them, but uh, prayers for them, and I didn't even get a chance to hear where this attack happened. Um, but this is one of many that have happened through this year, um, and prayers for those who were the victims as well as families, um, and uh, for the violence that just keeps going on and on and on. So let us keep the world in prayer as well as our country and community. For those who are able, please stand for the call to worship. We'll begin our call to worship by singing together, O Come All You Faithful, the first verse. O come, all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant, O
let us go to God in prayer. Faithful God, by whose spirit all people and places become holy, lead us by that spirit today. We have come to celebrate a birth that offers us rebirth. We have gathered that you might claim us as heirs with Christ and guide us as we become more faithful servants. Unite our hearts and minds in a chorus of praise that the life of this church might be renewed and refocused. Amen. Well, knowing that there are times in which we are disobedient to God's will, that we stumble and fall, let us now confess before God and in the presence of one another. Light of the world, shine upon us. Shine into the darkness of our hate and fear, that we may be a people of light and love. Shine into the darkness of our cruelty and oppression, that we may be a people of justice and righteousness. Shine into the darkness of our ignorance and false beliefs, that we may be a people guided by your truth. Light of the world, shine upon us, that we may reflect your light for all the world to see. God is faithful and abounding in steadfast love. In Christ, God has come to us to be our salvation. The birth of Jesus offers us hope, the promise of a new life and pardon in his name. Thanks be to God. Amen. come this day to continue to celebrate the birth of God with us, Emmanuel, to celebrate the birth of the Prince of Peace into our midst. And so since this Prince of Peace is with us and around us and within us, let us share the peace of Christ with one another. The peace of Christ be with you. <laughs> so this morning we have the Advent stocking, even though it's not Advent. I don't know whose idea this was. It was someone who was not here today, <laughs> Pastor Elaine, 
We thought it'd be a good idea to have the Advent stocking one more Sunday, mainly because she's not here. Yeah. Okay. But I'm glad that we have it. Have you say, got something? Do you mind pulling it out for me? Come on, I because I'm a little scared. All right, it's cough drops. No, it's a oh, it's a cookie. And I'm trying to figure out what's on the cookie. Is it any kind of design? Just an imprint? So, cookies. How many of you had cookies during this Christmas? How many of you had pie during this Christmas? How many of you have 23 more pounds on your body this Christmas? Yeah. So, Christmas... So, I'm, I don't even weigh 23 pounds. <laughs> so, Christmas cookies and other things that people bake are just such a wonderful thing. I don't know what you were thinking about when you brought this. Were you thinking about anything in particular? It just reminds me a lot of family and um, of friends. I know that people will bake things for other people and give them get, give the, to them as gifts. Um, it's something that we usually do around Christmas to celebrate. And I love the celebrations around Christmas, the things that we do for family and friends, the way in which we celebrate the birth of Jesus. And when I looked at the top of this, even though it's not um, necessarily this design, it reminded me of a pineapple. And I just realized or heard and was reminded that I think the pineapple is a symbol of hospitality. And that I think that's something that's really important for us. Hospitality is all about welcoming people, welcoming people into our homes, welcoming people into our church, making sure we have a welcome heart for folks who need that welcome heart. And so I think these cookies and the pineapple and Christmas are all about those kinds of things, that we continue to welcome folks in the name of Christ because that's what Christ came to do and to be for us in this world, to welcome us as well in a different way than we've been welcomed before. So thanks for bringing this along. Can you have it? All right. Did your mom make it? I don't know. It's our special family. Oh, good. Then I'm definitely keeping it. No. <laughs> so thank you for bringing this along. And I'm going to take this, and we will not see it again for a year. So that's good. So that's good. Actually, it's been really good. You guys have been great with this. Um, and hope you've enjoyed it, too. Let us go to God in prayer. Gracious God, we are thankful for this day and thankful that we continue to celebrate the birth of your Son into the world. Help us, O oh God, that we will not um, allow Christmas just to be a season, that we will indeed allow Christmas, the birth of the light of the world, to be a part of us all year long. We thank you for the many ways that you have shown us to be friends to, to strangers and family to many and the many ways in which we can enjoy life, the many ways in which we enjoy your blessings, but the, also remind us of the many ways that we can reach out to others, especially those in need. We thank you again for this day and for these youth that are here this day and for their families and for all who are here worshiping you. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Thank you. Our first scripture reading this morning is found in Isaiah chapter 63, beginning with the seventh verse. I will recount the gracious deeds of the Lord, the praiseworthy acts of the Lord, because of all that the Lord has done for us and the great favor to the house of Israel that he has shown them according to his mercy, according to the abundance of his steadfast love. For he said, surely they are my people, children who will not deal falsely, and he became their savior in all their distress. It was no messenger or angel, but his presence that saved him. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them. He lifted them up and carried them all the days of old.
The Gospel lesson this morning is found in the Gospel according to Matthew, the second chapter, beginning with the 13th verse, and I'll read 13 through 23. Now after they had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And Joseph got up, took the child and his mother by night, and went to Egypt, and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, Out of Egypt I have called my son. When Herod saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he was infuriated, and he sent and killed all the children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had learned from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, wailing in loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be consoled, because they were no more. When Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up and take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel, for those who are seeking the child's life are dead. And Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was ruling over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And after being warned in a dream, he went away to the district of Galilee. There he made his home in a town called Nazareth so that what, was been, what had been spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled. He will be called a Nazarene. May God add a blessing to the reading of God's word. <clears throat> so I hope everyone had a really nice Christmas, and so I just want to see a show of hands. How many of you were able to spend time with family or friends? How many were able to spend time with family or friends? I see a few hands that are not up, and I know that they did spend time with family or friends. Okay, how many were able to spend time with a, a baby or a child or a youth under 18 years old? How many were able to do that? Oh, you are so lucky. That is wonderful. That is wonderful. How many of you listen to Christmas music during the day? How many of you listen to Christmas music? Wow, that's really great. And how many of you enjoyed really good food? Yeah? Oh, yeah. All right. So we've already talked about that. Oh, I see someone back there who didn't raise their hand, so we will need to get a plate together for you. So, how many of you thought about Jesus on Christmas Day? Yeah? That's good. Sermon's over. All right. Don't clap. Okay, one, one, one more question for you. How many of you have already taken down the Christmas tree? Already taken down the Christmas tree. Well, you, that's because you're here. <laughs> yes. Anyone else taken down the Christmas tree? How many of you leave the Christmas tree up till January 6th? Excellent. Excellent. Today is December 29th, the fifth day of Christmas. You know that old song? We're not quite sure where it came from or if it has anything to do with the Christian calendar and the 12 days of Christmas. But we celebrate the 12 days of Christmas. And I kind of like keeping the tree up, uh, sometimes to, um, you know, some people's distress um, that we keep the tree up that long and don't put things away. Um, but we, we try to keep the Christmas tree up until January 6th. I know some people keep it up even beyond that. But this is a season, Christmas season, which I hope we don't just set aside for the 25th. And that's the only time we really think about what it means for Christ to be born into this world. Although Christmas Day has passed and the season will pass too, we have to realize that the work of Christmas continues on. So the work of Christmas continues on. We, we, not, not just the work that we do to get ready for family and get all the presents together and all of those things, but I mean the work of Christmas that we're called to do as Christians. That work of Christmas continues on. Even when the tree gets taken down and the lights and the presents put away and all of those other things. And I think our passages this morning remind us of why. 
The passage from the gospel lesson, as you know, if you are really listening to what it said, is a really difficult passage, a really difficult one to think about and think through. It's not just some fantasy written up in the Bible to dramatize Matthew's intent to see Jesus as a fulfillment of Scripture. But what happens in this story just read from the gospel is something that we know in our hearts and minds and souls because say, such things happen in our day and time too. You see, in our story, we have this family who flees danger <coughs> and oppression. In this case, they are able to find refuge in Egypt who accepts this immigrant family. Imagine that. Accepting an immigrant family fleeing oppression and danger. Can you imagine that? Can you see that their world and our world isn't that much different? And that there are times when people need to flee a danger and go to another place where they hope that folks will welcome them with hospitality and love. Hmm. Part of the danger, of course, in this story is Herod. And we know about the Herods of this world. They will do whatever they can to grasp onto power and wealth. They sow distrust of the other, just as Herod did in that day. They marginalize women and others, just as Herod did in that day. The Herods of this world act on their own behalf, not on behalf of everyone else, but on their own behalf in ways that are dehumanizing and immoral. This Herod, in this story, and those that followed him, was so fearful and out of touch with God that he decided to take the lives of the innocent to try to rid himself of this challenge to the throne. Hmm. Only he did not quite understand what the challenge was all about. And I think sometimes we get confused too. He believed that the challenge was to be power against power, violence against violence, hate against hate. Whoever won in the end would be the victor. But what this passage tells us this morning is that the battle is not for power. It's not for power. This passage is about a battle for our hearts. <coughs> Are we going to allow our hearts to be swayed by the kingdom of violence of the Herods of this world, with its focus on power and wealth and taking any means to reach immoral ends? Or are we going to choose a kingdom of peace and its focus on attentiveness to God? If you remember in the story, they were attentive to God. They listened to the dreams. They listened to the ways in which God spoke to them. Attentiveness to God is part of this kingdom of peace. And part of this kingdom of peace is also following a savior described by the prophet as the one who came to the people in their distress. A savior who came, who knew what people were going through, who knew of all the things that might be happening in the world, who knew about the struggle they might have. And he came to be with them, to be them to share in humanity. Now, I don't know about you, but I, like them thousands of years ago, feel a little bit distressed about this past year. I have been saddened by so much that's been going on in our country and around the world, and I've preached about it many a times, and I'm in some ways sorry that I have to continue preaching about these kinds of things. I've been sickened by attacks on immigrants and Jewish people, women, and so many others, and violent words and actions. The hateful speech and petulant and childish rants are just tiring, sickening. And as we heard this morning, we heard of another attack on a Jewish community. And right after that story, I heard that there have been 41 mass killings in the United States in 2019 alone. Unfortunately, I could go on. But I don't think I want to do that. I think you know what life is like. I think you know that when we gather here today, when we, 
we sing you know, joyful songs, we do feel that joy in our hearts, we also know what the world is really like. Well, as I was preparing for this sermon, uh, Sally was putting together a glossary for a book, and as she was doing that, she came across a definition for a medical condition that I think is appropriate to talk about here. It's called, and I'm probably going to get the pronunciation wrong, it's called, ta uh, let's see, Takotusubo cardiomyopathy. Got that? I can spell that for you. It is a weakening of the left ventricle caused by severe emotional or physical stress, such as loss of a loved one, sudden illness, a serious accident, or a natural disaster. It almost exclusively occurs in women. Not just women, but almost exclusively women. And I would add that some of the distress that's happening in our world today also causes this condition, which is also known as broken heart syndrome. I am sure in their immense grief, mothers and other families in Herod's world felt deep brokenness in their heart, that they felt this broken heart syndrome deeply in their hearts and souls, as we were told in the passage this morning that a voice was heard in Rama, wailing in loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be consoled. These are people in deep grief, people who know what it means to feel deeply a broken heart for the things that are going on in their lives. And I know that we too experience these very same broken hearts, maybe not for days at a time, but maybe every now and then. And maybe we don't experience the medical condition, but we experience the emotional and spiritual toll of the stress we encounter on a daily basis. Not just from what we hear and see in the world, but because of our own personal struggles, too. Now I know it's hard to talk about this stuff just a few days after Christmas, and I'm sorry, it's not my fault. It's in the lectionary, and I follow the lectionary. You want to blame someone? You know, don't blame me. But I hope that we can find some meaning in these passages today. Because I think it's best for us to know that what we are going to be dealing with not only tomorrow, but in the next year, and maybe even in our life to come. To know that this is somewhat the way of the world. But we also proclaim today that Christmas is the celebration of the kingdom of peace that we are invited to embrace, and that Jesus' birth brought light into the darkness of this world, and we are told in Scripture that the darkness will not overcome it. It might feel like that sometimes, it may feel like that on some days, but the promise of our faith is that the light will overcome the darkness. The Reverend Dr. Caroline Lewis reminds us that Christmas does not take away the possibility and potential of a broken heart. It purposefully takes it on. God is our savior in all that is going on. While the angels announce the birth of God, it is no mere messenger that saves us, but God's very presence. Think about that. It's God's very presence with us, not only then, but also today. God's love redeems. God's love lifts up. God's love carries us all. This is what we proclaim with our faith and with our lives. She goes on to say, the promise of this text is God's presence and power when the powers of this world try so very hard to convince us of God's absence. But Mary and Joseph knew better, and so do we. From a manger to the respite found in a land that was once enslaving of their very people that Mary and Joseph were, to a quiet town in Galilee, to the many places that even we go to in our lives, to the hospital rooms, to our friend's house, to help a neighbor. In the many ways we go, many places we go, God will be there too. Emmanuel, God with us. 
God going before us, God going with us, God being behind us, God being around us, God being within us. This is what it means to be a part of the kingdom of peace, to accept that God in the form of a vulnerable baby who came that we might have life. Along with this sense of God being with us that we proclaim and claim, I also know that there are others with us on the journey and that we need to depend on one another too. I am thankful for all of you for being those fellow travelers on this journey through Advent and Christmas and then Epiphany and through all the different days of our lives that we celebrate together and that we also walk together and I hope that we also in this journey support one another. For when dealing with grief and loss and a broken heart, it is a good thing to find the best support group you can. Maybe that's part of what we are called to be as a church, a support group for the brokenhearted, a place to bring our pain and our joy, a place to find some healing and a promise of God who will be with us, who is with us, and has become Emmanuel. I hope this is enough. Some days, I have to admit, it doesn't feel like it is. And then I see someone who shows me what faith is really all about. And I come to understand once again God with us and around us and within us. To claim what it means to be a citizen of the kingdom of peace is not something that's sentimental. It takes work. It's hard. It's hard to be a part of the kingdom of peace and to claim those values, especially in the world that says other values are more important. But to be a place that welcomes the stranger, that protects the marginalized, that lifts up those in need, that supports the brokenhearted, and that follows in the way of a savior whose power is love, is quite an amazing thing to be a part of. It is an amazing thing to be a part of. And so I hope that we will understand that the work of Christmas doesn't end on Christmas Day or when we put away the tree or when we put the presents away or when all of the leftovers are finally done. I hope that we will understand that the work of Christmas continues on because the birth of Jesus continues on in each of our hearts. And may that birth in our hearts be offered to the world as a light that God intends.